Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Abel Kane, and I am um, speaking to you now from New Delhi in India. And um, as the head of the Rethinking Youth program for the UNESCO Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Education for Peace and Sustainable Development. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the first dialogue of Talking Across Generations on Reimagining Education. I would now like to, um, we'd like to thank you once again for attending what will be an exciting dialogue with two youth and an education leader, uh, moderated by Mr. Shaka Kazal. But first, I would like to call uh, Dr. Anantha Doraipa, the director, inaugural director of our institute, um, who will um, indeed again extend a warm welcome to all of you, introduce uh, the concept of talking across generations at Mahatma Gandhi Institute. Thank you, Anantha. Thank you, Abel. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, and a very warm welcome to the panel for this uh, tag. I'm really excited. We haven't had a tag for quite some time, talking across generations. Um, COVID has really uh, thrown us a curveball that nobody actually expected. Um, but the good thing is that every cloud has a silver lining. And, and, and we at the Institute look at COVID as a game changer for the education system. I think uh, a system which has, which has been very difficult to really make drastic changes. And I see COVID as a tipping point. And, and we have to take advantage of this opportunity that has been presented to us to really look at education, reimagine education. I think that's what it is. Not making small changes in the margins, not talking about little changes in curriculum, uh, teaching, uh, uh, the way the institutions are working, but to really have a major impact. And, and I guess the first question that we always ask ourselves is, you know, what is it for? What is the purpose of education? Um, when, I've been, when I grew up, uh, when I reflect on my experiences, I see education primarily as uh, getting a job, getting a good job, and passing exams. I always thought that the way, the way we have been taught is to pass exams, not really to learn the subject, but I'm looking at the exams and trying to say, how am I going to pass these exams? And once the exams are over, it's gone. Uh, you know, just, okay, that's done and it's gone and we move on to the next. And I think we have to change that. Education now, on reflect, when I look at back, I sort of say it should have been fun. Uh, it should have had relevance to what I was trying to do. It needs to teach me how to live in this world, uh, not to be part of a, of a cog in a production system that we have now got ourselves caught into but something more for my own flourishing, to be happy. I want to learn for the purpose of learning, not just because I need to pass exams. Exams are just something that uh, should be to sort of say, have I learned? Have I uh, advanced my knowledge? So how do we do this? And I think the voices of the youth are extremely important. You know, the World Bank did a study many, many years ago called Voices of the Poor. Uh, in terms of uh, trying to look at poverty reduction. And they were really shocked at some of the things that the poor were asking for. It was just not on money and income, but it was about dignity. It was about uh, self-esteem. And so I, I am very confident that when we hear to the voices of the youth on education, we are going to hear some very, very interesting ideas and what they have to say. So I'm, I'm confident that there will be some very interesting things coming out of this discussion. I urge the young people to challenge the decision makers. I apologize, uh, Dr. Ali, but I want them to really push you. You are in a position that, that can actually make the change. And I urge you to, uh, you know, for people in my generation, she's much younger. So I, I think she would have already moved on from my particular generation where we don't listen we tend to sort of want to talk about what we already have made our minds up. We kind of pay lip service to the young people and then we continue with what we already had decided. I think uh, we, we need to change that and I am confident and I'm very sure that Dr. Ali will listen to you guys and take 
uh, cognizant of what you need to say, and hopefully MGIP can provide as a vehicle for that for that voices onto the decision makers uh, at, at the end of the day. But we want you to be also part of the decision making process. A change agents is what we call you. So with that, I would say have fun. That is always important. Chill and I look forward to sitting back and listening to you guys for the next one and a half hours. Chakra, uh, Chakra yeah. is, uh, let me say, Shaka. It's your, it's in your ball court. Thank you, and I'm very chill today and really excited for this uh, taggy discussion organized by UNESCO Mahatma Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Education for Peace and Sustainable Development. When I was asked to uh, moderate this, uh, these panels, uh, the one thing I was really excited about is bringing two generations into this discussion. Uh, this is truly talking across generations on reimagining re education. At a time we are, um, we are seeing a lot of uh, disruptive uh, things happening to the education process. Bringing two generations today, looking at reimagining education, uh, starts with understanding the purpose of education. And we have uh, two great uh, youth speakers, uh, Kesowen uh, Clemmings from Jamaica and uh, Manila uh, Seresiti from India. And uh, we are joined by uh, Dr. Ali, uh, Minister of Education in Maldives. And a uh, uh, very interesting thing about Dr. Ali today as well is the fact that Dr. Ali is a professor herself so she's been throughout all the spectrum of education, uh, from the learning to the um, to teaching, and as well uh, to now being a, a minister of education. I'm going to start uh, this uh, panel uh, about talking about the purpose of education. And when we talk about purpose, we have to look at the broader aim, the broader meaning and reason, the end goal of a particular thing. So usually we start with the question, uh, of sharing our experiences with why did we go to school and each one of us uh, has a different purpose for or a way that they looked at education. So I'm going to start with uh, Kesowen uh, from Jamaica to tell us uh, her experience about to share with us uh, why did she go to school. Kesowen, the floor is yours. Good morning everyone. Um, one of the main reasons why uh, why I chose to go to university or go to school um, was because of the fact that I never really had a choice. Um, in terms of social standing and um, being, I wouldn't, I, would, I wouldn't have considered myself and my family to be middle class, um, even though my parents were educators, um, just based on the fact that we couldn't afford certain things. Um, many would have classified us as being somewhat poor um, to a um, lesser extent. Um, and, f and because of that reason, I had to go to school because for many, education was the um, would, would have been the only way um, we could have gone out of that cycle of poverty. Um, my father wasn't, um, my father couldn't go to university because they had me at a young age. My mother struggled through university. Um, so for me, it was kind of, I had to go because they had to, they had to make um, a lot of decisions, not because they wanted to, they had no choice. So even though, um, even though I would have wanted to do certain things before I went to university, because I knew how my country was set up, I knew I never had time to waste, so I had to go. Um, and that, that's not only my story, that's the story for many, many Jamaicans who are in the same position. Um, because if it is that we are to come out of um, poverty for us, if it is that we are to be successful, if it is that we are, um, we are to move out of a particular social standing, our system would have dictated that we be educated. So that's one of the main reasons why I went to college. Um, so we're going to move to uh, Manila to, for her to share her experience of uh, why did uh, you go to school? 
well i went to school and the college and university just because uh, i want to study i want to uh, like get not get the knowledge but uh, later on i realized that it's just not for the knowledge or the marks or the grades but it's just to uh, get the net, uh, i mean get to know the people who will truly stick to you in the future get to know the professors and the teachers and the lecturers uh, who will definitely help you whenever you are in hurdle or when you when you when you whenever you want some mentoring but uh, most of us doesn't realize that uh, we all go to school or college because uh, we want uh, like we want to make our parents uh, like we want to make our parents uh, goals and their ambitions come true uh, like we are uh, we are the face of our parents we are really representing our parents because they had they couldn't get those chances because of the financial issues or uh, because at that time all the thought was uh, it was okay for the girls to be uh, to study just the fifth class i'm 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 talking about my mother who who lived in a village so for her i mean she she wants to become a police officer but she couldn't become that so i'm just representing my parents so i went to college just because of because of representing my parents get the good grades uh make a name for myself like uh, if i if i contact someone in the future they are definitely up for helping me so then also to get the job but uh, later i realized that it's not just for the job i am going to the college because uh, college made me realize so many things uh, and i'm definitely going to speak up about that uh, in in a short span but uh, really college is something uh, that made me realize so many things so yeah that's how that's why i went to cash thank you manila so before we move to dr ali i'd like to uh, i'd like to put a poll up uh, actually to see uh, our audience today um uh, to see our audience why did they go to school so we heard fr- we heard uh, kesowen's uh, main uh, reason which is she you know she w- she wanted to avoid poverty she wanted to um you know get the economic uh, growth and we heard also from Manila about the social standing and about uh, you know the personal growth so let's see we have the question up so i'll ask our audience please um, to answer the question and then we'll see we'll be sharing the results shortly dr ali we'll uh, wait uh, so you uh, will wait for the results to be up before we start dr uh, ali i'd like uh, to ask you for you personally years back uh, why did you go to school uh, if you can let us know your experience with your reasons why did you go to school years back um, then yeah if you can unmute i believe Uh, thank you shakar um uh, first of all let me thank the unesco mahatma gandhi institute of education for peace and sustainable development for giving me this opportunity to interact with these two very inspiring youth leaders and to discuss the purpose of education with them um I actually relate very much with what both um, Manila and uh, Kason has said because the reason um, I went to college was also to get a good uh, job to earn money because i i was the only one from my family who got the chance to do higher education so i wanted to uh, come out of the rut rut and do something new and uh, that has actually helped me today uh, it has helped me to come where i am today thank you i and i think we got the uh, results from our poll um most said so uh, most people 44% i believe uh yeah 44% did say that they went the purpose of them going to school was for economic opportunity livelihood better future and achieving our goals uh followed by freedom growth and exposure 19% of you thought that's uh the purpose and then 13% a stepping stone to adulthood and that more of a growth and exposure um we all have you know our we all have our different um and then also we have the new skills to prepare for the real world of course and become an informed uh, citizen then we all have our different experiences with uh, why we went uh, to pursue our education uh, dr uh, ali do you believe that um, there is like that the world today in our uh, today uh, that 
the infrastructure for education is there for those to pursue an education for the sake of their livelihood and economic opportunity, especially at a time where we see that, you know, most schools are closed. We need to, you know, be on our uh, computers to learn and some people don't have internet. So there are a lot of challenges today for someone to go and pursue their education. Um, as a minister, how do we, you know, how do we make this uh, a better situation? How can more people be able to actually, um, you know, find that purpose in pursuing an education? Uh uh, thank you, uh, Shakar. Um, the education systems has been disrupted due to COVID-19, and all of us are actually facing the after effects of that. And um, the prolonged school closures all around the world, this has led uh, most countries to think about alternative ways of uh, providing education to ensure that learning never stops. This has been true for us too here in Maldives as well. So um, our main focus was to uh, keep education going. Education continuity was in our minds. So we rushed to distance modes of teaching, like uh, using telecasted uh, TV lessons and various other online platforms. But uh, for us, this was an unplanned and rapid shift. Uh, we were not prepared for online teaching or distance modes of teaching. So I would say while it um, highlighted existing and new disp disparities, it did open doors for new opportunities. It has also given rise to several, several challenges which we are trying to uh, resolve at the moment. Um, Coming back to the question you asked, do we have the infrastructure for it? Um, I would take examples from Maldives. Maldives being a small island state country uh, where the islands are geographically distributed in a way that access is quite difficult. So um, to reach out to the students, the only platform we could use were uh, the TVs plus internet. But the internet was again a challenge for us uh, because um, many students did not have fast speed internet or they did not have a device to get access to internet. So uh, that was one of the challenges. But uh, I think uh, most of the countries are facing this. But um, all in all, I think uh, we are moving towards the right path where uh, we have actually recognized the digital divide and other challenges that are there to provide education in such a situation. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Um, Keso, Keso and, um, so we saw today that the majority of people actually, and uh, you included and myself, uh, are, you know, we, the 44% of the audience here, livelihood economic opportunity is the main purpose for today in 2020 that we are uh, pursuing an education. Do you, what are the reasons people will actually, you know, what's the purpose of education in 50 years from today? If we want to, you know, go 50 years uh, in time, what would you, would you think that these would be the same reasons as today? Would you think it would be, you know, different purposes? How do you envision the educational system's purpose in 50 years from 2020? So that would be 2070. Um, when I saw this question, I was a bit perplexed by it. Um, the responses that I had gotten from my friends was a little, it was a little bit pessimistic in the sense that they, they said that, well, education 50 years from now will be the same as it is today because 50 years ago, it was the same. Um, but my, my understanding of it is that education for, for many people is based, it's, uh, it's a system um, for many, education, the education system, especially in a lot of countries, it reflects somewhat of a business. Mm -hmm. um, so, based, so th the thing with economics is that the market changes its demands based on the needs of the society, right? And so by this principle, it means that 50 years from now, the society would have changed significantly. Um, therefore, in ne um, the needs of the society will change. So the school system can be described, as I said, a business, and it fulfills the needs of the market. Um, so whatever it is that the society will need in 50 years, the school is always going to be necessary because people are, um, people are always going to need to learn. They're always going to need to um, get certified in certain skills based on the progression of the society. 
Um, so based on that factor and that factor alone, school will always be necessary. People will always seek fit to go to school um, because of the ever-changing environment that we're in. Thank you, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Manila, um, is, will school be still necessary, uh, like Kesuan was saying, in 50 years in your vision uh, for this question? Yes, I would definitely like to answer that question. I even asked the same question to my friends, like, what do you think uh, the education system will be in the 50 years? Like, one of my friends said there will be no education system at all. I mean, there won't be any colleges or schools. Was, then the, that question will be, that answer was backed up by some of, some of my friends, like saying that, how do you think that would happen? I mean, uh, uh, would it be uh, like, will it, we'll be experiencing the things which, were exp which we are experiencing right now? Like, uh, do we get to uh, network with our people? Do we get to have fun with our friends? Or uh, do we get to uh, improve our skills? Like, there are so many uh, opportunities we are getting through college and through schools. That wouldn't happen in the 15 years if, if there is no, uh, like, uh, uh, offline education system and completely, it will, it, it shifts to an online platform or self-based learning. That wouldn't ha that should not be happen. So I definitely below, uh, believe, like, the education system in the future will be so much more than what we are experiencing right now. And the people, and the, and the, uh, the youth will get to learn so many skills. Uh, Manila, uh, Manila and uh, Kisuan, actually, I looked into uh, one comment that was under this question somewhere and uh, some said, no, maybe I wouldn't need, you know, I wouldn't need education later. I can depend on my skills. So skill and education. Uh, and then when we talk about the vision for 50 years, uh, the purpose, do you think skills, uh, Kesuan and Manila, would you like to see skills, you know, take over the education system or would you like, or are they two separate things and it depends on each person? What's your insight on that? Well, I would like to answer that first. Uh, but definitely skills and the, uh, the, the things we learn from the college or school is very different. Uh, right now, uh, people are getting the new skills through online platforms, which they haven't got through schools. Like uh, people are getting to learn about MS Excel or artificial intelligence or something like big data, like in the technology field. And then they are learning about music, the different kinds of musical instruments uh, through other people. My God. Our industry is updating, so we we should we cannot expect everything from school. There has to be something we have to. Uh, like maybe just we we all have internet right so we definitely have to take the help of internet too um dr ali so a 50-year vision of uh, purpose of education um and as someone working now in the policy related to education as a minister Will the purpose why people pursue an education uh, drastically change in these 50 years uh, or is education going to still hold on that main pillar or a few main pillars, uh, which are, you know, the economic, the personal growth, etc.? Uh, thank you, Shakar. Um, to answer that question, let me first highlight the broad purpose of education. Uh, what differentiates a human from another animal is their powers of reason. Humans have developed reasoning to an advanced degree. In fact, the essence of being human is to think. When French philosopher René Descartes was asked uh, why he knew he existed, he did not say because he had a body. He did not say because he can hear, feel, or smell. René said, I think, therefore I am. In other words, we know we are living because we think. So essentially, to think is to be human. It is the defining feature. The better we think, the more human we become. When we think about things deeply, we say that's critical thinking. We think about our surroundings, our past, our present, and the future critically. So critical thinking depends on several factors. You cannot think in a vacuum. For that, you need some content. We go to school get, to get this content. So if I say, take an example from, let's say, climate. If I want to think about climate, I need some facts that I should know before I can think about that. And um, without these facts, our thinking will not be right. So to be human, to think carefully, we need content. But content alone is also not enough. 
if content was sufficient for thinking then books and computers would obviously be better than hum- humans there are special ways of thinking these are called processes and we call it heuristics just as important as content is for thinking these processes or heuristics is important so as i have just mentioned to think carefully about anything we need content we need heuristics and there's something else we need that is the time factor when i put a question to you how much time you take to answer it or process it for that we call the time factor or power so to think we will need content heuristics and the power so uh, what i believe is the reason people went to college yesterday was to develop their thinking the purpose people go to college today is to develop their thinking and the purpose they would go to college tomorrow is also to develop their thinking but of course uh, the pedagogies the modalities that the universities or colleges use, use might change and as uh, kason said uh, the needs of the the education that is provided would be based on the society so um, if skills are things that are needed by the society then the universities would be providing the uh, courses related to skills and such but what i feel is the purpose of education will not change thank you dr ali we're going to um i have uh, first time getting some questions that will be uh, from the audience and i want to remind the audience that in the chat box you can uh, ask us uh, any question you have for our speakers or dr ali but now i'll put the second poll up which is uh, why will you go to college or send our uh, children to college in the future so the uh, poll will be up and then we'll reflect upon that together so why will you go to college in 50 years from now and then um you can submit the answers meanwhile and um, there's a very interesting question dr ali that uh came out is why should we focus on grades and jobs instead on, uh, of focusing on holistic development so you know with the education system there is there is a focus on grades on uh, assessment and evaluation and then uh, even with the poll the first poll we put up uh, we saw how economic opportunity is 44% of our audience it's their purpose for education so when you are thinking of grades and when you're thinking of the profession you know if i want to be an architect for example but you know i can't be in certain place because there are too many architects so i am thinking of my job as part of my educational experience here so why should we focus on that not on the holistic development is this something uh, you know is it a gap in the educational system or is it a gap in our way that you know we uh, we interact with the educational system um uh, thank you shakar i think um, that is the way we think actually i don't believe that we should focus on grades and attainment uh, without focusing on becoming a holistic person the whole purpose of an education system is to create a, a holistic person by giving them providing them a holistic education so uh, while you are uh, working on your academics you should work in developing yourself as a good human being characteristics like empathy characteristics like tolerance resilience these things are equally important so a school environment or university environment should provide the students with these other characteristics or opportunities to develop those characteristics thank you um we'll share the poll answer uh, the the second poll uh, right now the results um the team will share with me the results so it was a personal growth um that people believe they will be going to college in 50 years that got 33% the majority followed by uh, building skills like critical thinking which dr ali was uh, talking about and um, to be important citizen driving change in the society again what uh, dr ali kesuen and manila uh, had mentioned um then the passport uh, then the network for career advancement and the passport to the future thank you Uh, again for our audience in the Q&A uh, there's a Q&A section that you can ask your questions um now i'm going to get into um a question with manila first um from scale 1 to 5 one being completely unhappy um and then 5 6 7 being completely happy um how happy are uh, or unhappy are you about the education system in you know in your country 
Well, I would like Point to rate five. it as uh, three, maybe three. Three. Uh, okay, so when, and I'm yeah. coming back to you, Manila, in a second, but let's see. Okay, so when, how, one to five? I would give it the same three. Three. Um, yeah. So, what, why is it three? Um, you know, why it's not four or five or two? Um, but I'm going to ask, you know, if you can think about that, I'll talk uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Ali. So for, for me as well, I went to school in, uh, you know, in Lebanon, um, and it is at three maybe as well for me. How, you know, how can we make the education system at a four and a five? And what are some of the, you know, policies, resources that need to come together for, you know, better education system, uh, you know, worldwide? Shaka, that's a very good question. The reason why we are having dialogues like this is to improve our education system. To uh, the actual situation of schools, colleges, and universities would be known by the youth today. So we need your voices. We need your participation in uh, formulating our education policies so we know what is there to improve for the future. Uh, if that question was asked from me, how how happy was I? Actually, I was someone who has uh, gone to colleges in four different stages of my life. Uh, I have been uh, schooled from my home. I have gone to two different countries with very two different cultures. And I have also uh, worked while I was uh, studying. I have um, studying full-time and full-time work, plus part-time work and full-time studies. So I have experienced uh, studying in different situations. So um, if you ask me that question, how would I rate my education? I would say um, a four, maybe. But uh, at that time, when I was in school, there were so many things that I wanted to improve. And uh, today, I, when I'm here, uh, it's sad to say that uh, I'm to, when we reflect back on that, has those changes come now? No, I would say no. But uh, still, uh, we can do work on it. It's good that we have a good team who has been in the education system for a long time. And um, we are dedicated to bringing these changes. But we need to hear from today's youth. We need to highlight what is wrong with the education system and then improve on it. And that's why I'll be asking now, Kesu uh, Wen, uh, so you said a three. Just give me one for example, one real example based on your personal experience, if you can share it with us on why it was a three and not a four or a five. Um, one of the major reasons why I would, have, I would have given it a three was based on inaccessibility, not only to me, um, but to other members of the, the, the wider community. Um, mm -hmm especially those who uh, would have had a disability of any kind. Um, I can say that my school is trying in terms of making improvements um, for access for those um, particular um, type of people. Um, but there is so much more um, that they can do. And at this point, they just haven't done it. Um, for example, for some, for some students, they would have to pay interpreters if they're deaf. If they're deaf and they needed an interpreter in class, they would have to pay for one to come. And even the lecturers, knowing that there is a deaf student in class that has to pay for an interpreter, some of them still don't show up to the lecture. So it's kind of disheartening for people to be paying for their education, yet other people don't respect that. Dr. Ali, um, for, for inaccessibility, um, maybe if you can let us know a little bit about the Maldives and how has this progressed when it comes to accessibility of stu you know, students with uh, disabilities? Um, maybe we can draw some, you know, um, draw some example out of Maldives to be shared with our audience today. Uh, recently, we have actually um, set up a department for inclusive education in our ministry. That was in 2018. But um, it was started uh, 
a long way back, but uh, the situation in the Maldives was the same as Kesson just mentioned. Still, there are students that we are not able to reach because they have uh, disabilities and other learning difficulties. Uh, this uh, problem is more highlighted during a situation like this because the students cannot be brought into school. The students with disabilities and students who have learning difficulties, they have to stay at home and uh, we are finding it difficult to reach out to them. So that issue of access is there in the Maldives. And here the problem is more because of the way the islands are distributed. Uh, we have a very good system here in the central, in the capital city, but uh, in the rural islands, it's hard to reach these students and uh, we do not have enough uh, trained teachers as well. So we are facing similar problems as Keson just mentioned. Uh, Manila, uh, maybe if you can uh, briefly uh, tell me what is something, real example as well, of why you uh, rated three, not a five or a four? Uh, I will just tell you why it is three, because uh, I have seen improvement in my country. Uh, when I was studying my first standard, I was taught through radio lessons. Like if I want to get the more, um, if I want to learn how the morality works or how the society works, I was, uh, I was told through the radio lessons. Then it was through, like, uh, while I was in sixth standard or so, we were, we were given the lab experiences. And then it was uh, online, like we are getting the moves. So that is, I am seeing the improvement. So that is why I gave the three. I wasn't giving the four or five because uh, I, want, uh, I want the mentorship to be happening in the schools or colleges because uh, uh, most of us are unable to uh, know what their passion is until they reach the stage where they left the school. Uh, and people are realizing that, okay, this is not my passion. I want to go back to learning again. Now I have to learn two or three more years, uh, get the degree and then get the job. It, it won't work like that. We have to, I mean, there should be a uh, great mentorship uh, happening in our schools. And then we are not getting the hands-on training. Most of us, like, uh, let's just say if you are paying well, uh, if you are financially stable and if you are going to a college where you are paying lakhs of fees, then you are getting the best education out there. there is, I, I will not point out to that because uh, there are some great institutions who are doing that. Uh, but uh, to the people who are unable to pay or uh, who are financially unstable, they are left behind. Thank you, Manila. Now, I... Uh, I'll ask uh, something to Dr. Ali, meanwhile, but meanwhile, I'll first put the third poll, which is from scale one to five, how happy or unhappy are you with the current education system? One being completely unhappy, five being super happy. And then, um, so the poll will be put up in just a few seconds. Dr. Ali, um, what is something you see in the education system today in Maldives that you would like to uh, change it uh, so that it's, you know, it's different in 50 years? Thank you. Um, that's a very big question, actually. Um, I did my thesis on um, education policy changes reform in Maldives for the past 115 years. So um, I have actually looked into uh, the issues in the system and how people have addressed it over a period of 115 years. And now uh, we are here with our policies. And now you are asking me in 50 years, what would I change? There are so many things that I want to change. For one, I want uh, all the students to have access to very good, high quality education. This can only be done with high quality teachers. First of all, uh, we, need, we need our teachers to be very quality. To do that, they have to have a good education and their remuneration, their salary and other benefits given to our teachers should be good too. So that's one area I would improve. Another area I would improve is uh, the way the curriculum is delivered. As we have talked about before, what we want is a holistic child. So to provide that, uh, just uh, teaching them the content out of the books is not enough. Just teaching for them to sit an exam is not enough. We want them to know the skills. We want to teach them the life skills. So they can be very capable citizens who will contribute to the betterment of the country. So there are so many things I would change if I get the chance. 
Dr. Ali, as we talk about these changes, um, you know, uh, the, poll, uh, the poll results just came out and 43% of our audience are unhappy with their education system, followed by 25% who are neutral and only 14% are happy and 2% are uh, unhappy. Um, this is, I believe this is a little bit alerting when we have 43, you know, percent of, um, you know, a group, this, a group in a discussion about education, unhappy about their education. How do you address uh, the 43% Dr. Ali who are unhappy with uh, their education system today? Uh, what is something that a minister of education who's been doing uh, great things in her country, what is something that you can let them know so they don't lose hope because when you're unhappy about something, uh, even it was something I'll let you know quickly while we're, uh, before you answer, someone even said, actually in 50, um, in 50 years, um, uh, maybe I don't have to go to, uh, you know, to school, maybe I'll just do it online. Um, it's sad to see the poll results, 43% um, yeah. <laughs> Unhappy that no, I'm sad right now. I think you know it's an it's a really alerting number about you know about education. It is so. Um, first, we have to find out why they are unhappy, and uh, we need to address those issues. What are certain things we can help to improve schooling to make the school experience a better experience for them? Um, what I believe is, uh, what I experienced when I was studying was that uh, we were forced to study for an exam. We were told that if we do not pass an exam, if we do not do good in school, then we will not have a good job. So we study with this focus and our parents are very competitive. They, they want their children to be the best in the school. So uh, outside of uh, studying from the book, they don't have much opportunities to improve as a human being. So what I feel is if we provide opportunity, opportunities for our students to engage in uh, community activities, in ac activities where they can um, help build uh, themselves with human qualities like compassion, empathy, resilience, tolerance, these things, I think then that would, they would be happier. I would actually... Um, I'll give you an example from a research I read uh, about today. It says that uh, about 27% uh, graduates who study a particular program, about 27% are actually happy with the jobs they get or the jobs they are in now. There is a big question, why aren't they happy? What are we missing in schools? And um, the recommendations that the research has provided is to uh, include programs in schools where the students can actually explore their patients, explore uh, what happiness is, what makes them happy. So give them that opportunity in school, provide it to them. And there are a few colleges which are doing this thing in the colleges and uh, students who graduate from these particular programs are doing quite well in the job, job market as well. I have a um, comment from uh, Sayan Tan that I'd like to uh, read out loud and maybe uh, Kesowen and Manila uh, can reflect on that. Um, if I could, I wouldn't even go now, online or offline. College somehow monopolizes the entire act of interacting and learning by shackling intent, passion, and choice to a particular curriculum and mode of assessment. Why does there have to be standardization and institutionalization of something so sacred and fundamental uh, to the human faculty and spirit? Um, this is one of the reasons why, you know, why people are uh, unhappy with, uh, you know, the education system right now. Any comment any uh, of our speakers or Dr. Ali would like to make on, uh, uh, for, uh, to uh, Sayantan? Um, I would totally I'm agree. A lot of, it just so, you know, I'm seeing a lot of people say, yeah, I agree, yes. Um, this comment just appealed to me. Kesoyan, sorry to interrupt uh, what we're seeing. Um, I said, um, I totally agree with the statement and it isn't, it isn't necessarily surrounded only by like college education, but the education system in like in general, um, for my particular country, 
what we have is that certain schools are labeled traditional high schools and then the latter are labeled as technical high schools. So I went to a traditional high school. So I got the math, the, the, the literature, you know, more um, reading, writing, arithmetic. And the technical schools would have gotten um, more skills training. So they would have plumbing and carpenting and, and electrical. And I remember having a conversation with my principal asking her, why is it that we don't have carpenting and all of those other things like the other schools? Her comment was that, um, or my, the students in my school would not have been interested. So it was kind of like, so um, I, I would have preferred it to be mixed. There are students in, in the technical high schools that wanted to do literature, that wanted to do all of these other things, but they were cast aside saying, no, um, these, are, these subjects are for particular type of people and these subjects are for yours. So I totally agree with um, in terms of kind of putting education in a box for a certain group of people. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Ali, does uh, solving this or putting solutions to this, um, should we how do we engage more youth? Like today, for example, uh, in the uh, tag yeah, we are we, in the tag we are in right now, we're bringing youth to the policy making of education, um, which is great. How do we take this model and make it actually in our education systems, uh, you know, worldwide, that youth? people who benefit from education, the recipients of education are actually putting the policies uh, for how education run. I believe uh, one of the major stakeholders of the education system are youth, are the students. So we need to hear their voices. Uh, it's not uh, only by giving them a chair from a board that is responsible for making policies. We need their participation. We need mm -hmm. their participation and we need to listen to their voices. As I mentioned before, it is important because they are the people who are living this now. So they would know what is wrong in the system and they would have solutions for uh, what is to come. And it is them who's going to live with the challenges. They are generation that is going to live with the challenges of the policies we set out today. Thank you. Uh, question to uh, you, doctor, from our audience. Um, why so how do we extend education to tribal areas and conflict settings what does education means for people in these areas um so yeah we were talking i i believe uh, kisowen was talking about accessibility and uh, within the educational system uh, this question take it more on a broader level on a broader sort of uh, outlook of you know people in places where they don't have internet Manila was mentioning about the internet connection, um, conflict zones, uh, tribal, uh, you know, um, remote places, rural places. Where should we start with when it comes to, um, you know, bettering the education community for them, system for them? Thank you, Shakar. That's a very good question. Here in Maldives, um, because of the COVID situation, we are also uh, having the same issue, the challenge of reaching out to all our students. Uh, one of the um, things we did at the start of this uh, whole COVID uh, situation was to do a survey to find out how many of our students actually have access to internet. And we also found out how many students had access to TV, and we found out that most students have access to television than internet. Therefore, initially we started by telecasted lessons, but um, if people are living in conflict zones, uh, areas like that, they may not even have TV. So uh, we should go to other modes. Different countries have used different modes. Some have used paper-based lessons, where they actually provide the paper-based uh, lessons to the students, but there has to be a way to transport the lessons to where the people are. The best way uh, that most of the countries actually used was radio and TV, because there's a higher reach using these devices. Internet is a good mode, but the problem is that uh, most of the students do not get access to fast speed internet or they do not have devices to access internet from. Thank you, uh, Dr. Manila. Um, <clears throat> Manila, in India, uh, 
you know, the internet, um, the accessibility for in rural areas. Um, how, how do we, you know, how do we start by uh, solving this issue? So uh, Dr. Ali was mentioning radio, television, higher access, higher reach. Are there other areas that, you know, we can focus on or are, do you have any question to Dr. Ali, um, you know, about how can we increase the reach? Okay, before answering that question, I would just like to give an example of uh, how students are fighting COVID. Like this, this thing will definitely resonate with the idea of uh, spreading uh, internet connection to the rural people. Right now, there is uh, around 1300 people from uh, 135 countries uh, helping students and helping the mothers, helping the families, helping the, uh, like the disabled persons everywhere every person around the world by providing them clinical resources and uh, uh, like free webinars like mostly if you, even if you die, if that has to happen you have to have internet connection but the, uh, these people are helping their local local people they are volunteering themselves these people are fighting for the covid so i mean there are even many more people who are just volunteering and they are working for the non profit organizations so i believe the non profit organizations would be the best one for the for spreading of this internet connection like uh, because the people in non-profit organizations doesn't uh, uh, want to ex uh, they won't expect any fr anything from the uh, the main people the lead the founders of that organizations so they are working for the free so maybe these people can volunteer themselves uh, go around the villages and find what their problems are and maybe they could come up with the answer like uh, they, uh, they have the questions and we can come up with the answers we need to know the what their problems are first before coming to the answers um would you, should we like start counting on you know artificial intelligence dr ali and uh, you know robots maybe to for for bettering education or um, is that something maybe that could help in, let's say, rural areas today? For example, online, you know, online learning, it's become more of a privilege because if I don't have proper internet connection, if I don't have, if I'm, if I don't have a computer, because I can't then have my kids have access to education. So, what is, you know, what is the solution here, or what is something we can do um, so that we protect a generation from not getting the, you know? the education they need. Uh, thank you, Shakar. Um, I agree with what Manila just said. Uh, Nonprofit organizations, they are doing a great job actually trying to reach out to the students who are the most vulnerable. Even here in Maldives, UNICEF, UNESCO is helping us reach out to these students. Um, you have mentioned about artificial intelligence, but as you have just said, um, internet is a privilege. So artificial intelligence, that would also be a privilege. It may not solve the problem of reaching out to the most vulnerable. So we have to come up with other ways of reaching out to our students. Um, and um, I always believe in the good teacher. I don't think the teacher can be replaced by your robot. A good teacher can actually teach you the academic content as well as so many other values and I believe it can never be replaced. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Uh, so, when, so let's go back to, you know, the purpose uh, of education. And we, we talked about we each, uh, you know, pursue education for uh, different purposes, different reasons, but we have sort of the same track, um, you know, for that purpose. But what, and we talked about our current education system, you gave it three. What would, and I want to hear a concrete answer to this question, what would your ideal education system be like? Wow. Um, nice. I can't. And, and yeah. As well, we'll be answering. So whoever is ready to answer, just go ahead. <laughs> I can't give you like a general answer, um, but in terms of one particular area, um, Dr. Ali spoke to this in terms of um, the good teacher. What I found was that a lot of teachers lack basic empathy. Um, a lot of educators who understand the system and understand um, the faults in the system, um, they don't go the extra mile for students. 
So what you found, what you find is that a lot of students are discouraged even now. Um, so my ideal educational system would would um, find would I would I would prefer I would like to see educators who are dedicated to what they're doing, who are empathetic to the students that they're teaching, and who actually have a, a great concern um, for for the job that they have in terms of carving or shaping the minds of tomorrow. Thank you, uh, Kiswan. Uh, Manila, what would your ideal education system be like? Before answering that question, I would like to give you my example. I was a computer science student, but I want to shift to psychology or neuroscience. But you see, uh, not only in India, wherever, wherever the education institutions in the world may be, uh, the chances of getting into psycho like doing the masters in psychology or neuroscience, you need to have a basic knowledge uh, in those fields. But education, uh, what our education system is doing is without understanding our uh, need, like our our passion changes continuously. If there is a technology coming up, we, we want to learn that. If there is a new skill coming up, we want to like get to know about that and be a professional in that. My my passion changed. Now I want to pursue in that area, but I was objected by the education system. I want that to be changed. There should not be uh, like uh, this is your basic. Maybe you have you need to have a basic grades uh, before to get into that area. If there is a passion, you will learn uh, anything without uh, without anything objecting you. The, uh, the the prior subject knowledge is not a barrier. So I want no uh, no requirements to join the education institution. Just like I mentioned again before, mentoring should be there and uh, hands-on training, the industrial exposure, uh, maybe the industrial system could uh, bring their own projects to like give the projects to the students, they could do that. Let's just say the film industry, they could uh, definitely ask, they could provide the tools and ask the arts and the arts people to do the short film. Like they, the people are uh, maybe uh, like uh, the people could uh, the people that will be uh, involved in that area would be marketing people, video uh, video editing, etc, etc. All these are the skills we need. So if we get the live projects in our uh, educational system while we are studying, we are getting that experience, work experience, I should say, before entering, before you're, you're, you're getting the job. So that's, that's my ideal, the ideal, ideal education system would be. Thank you, Manila. Dr. Ali, uh, are we, uh, you know, are we worldwide, are we on the right track for the ideal education system? I think we have to be optimistic um, with uh, more voices of the youth, um, with more people talking about what a good education system should be. I think uh, we are in the right path. So um, it is hopeful. Uh, we should never lose hope. And, yeah, go on. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Um, we are in the right direction in in the Maldives, uh, from what I, you know, from what I'm uh, hearing from you, from India, from. But how do we do it? You know, are we on the right direction? How do we redefine education in the context of politics and corruption in some areas? Uh, so we may be on the right track in so many areas, and then in some areas not so much. So how do we redefine education there? I think um, education should be made uh, the number one priority of any country because it is through education that we build societies, we build nations. So that a priority should be given to education. That means a good a portion of the national budget should be actually uh, given to develop education systems. And um, to add to what Moneyline uh, Keston just said, in for, uh, to envision how an ideal education system would be in addition to what they have mentioned i also believe that we should um, make we should help students make thoughtful decisions about the tra trajectory of their lives and empower them with resources to do that and uh, colleges should actually give them opportunities to reflect during their college years on how to create lives meaningful and with purpose as manila just mentioned give them the opportunity to look for what they are good in and give them resources to help them build those skills thank you uh, dr ali we are getting to uh 
at the end of our session, there is a fourth poll that we'll put up uh, uh, right now, which is from scale to one to five, one being completely unhappy and five being completely happy. How happy or unhappy are you with our taggy uh, dialogue today? I am, let me, I'm voting too for this. So we're gonna see the results now. Um, today, you know, we talked about the purpose uh, of education and uh, variety of, uh, you know, different um, approach, you know, different uh, insights. Um, you know, young people, young youth spoke to, uh, do, you know, talk to Dr. Ali about their concerns, about what their hopes and what we have to look forward to. I want to continue this dialogue, actually, on, of course, on all the platforms uh, for UNESCO Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Education for Peace and Sustainable Development. Um, I, again, uh, we have two more sessions on um, we have a session on Monday and uh, we have a session on the 2nd of September. Uh, we'd like to continue the theme of this, uh, you know, this conversation, this dialogue. I'm waiting to get the results of the final poll to see if, you know, how happy uh, were our audience. Any final remarks, Kisuen, Manila, and uh, Dr. Ali, very brief, because we have, uh, okay, good news though, 46% are happy and 24% are, very happy. Now I'm, you know, now we're all extremely happy. We'd love to know how from people who answered they're unhappy or uh, neutral, we'd love to know how, what things should change for the next uh, Tangy Dialogue uh, sessions. And uh, I'll uh, close with final, very brief, very brief remarks from Kisuen in Manila and uh, Dr. Ali, Minister of Education in the Maldives. Kisuen, you start, you, uh, you know, the youth today are going to lead the, the, end, the finale. Um, I am very happy with today's discussion. Um, for many, many don't get the opportunity that, that we have currently to sit with policymakers, to sit with people who are actually, um, who actually have a hand in how we're being educated. Um, I would like to see more, um, more, more opportunities for young people to engage with policymakers to make sure that we always have a bottom top approach to policymaking. Um, instead of a top to bottom approach, it means that policymakers who, who haven't been in a classroom, who haven't you know, actually taught somebody, who, that those people are normally the ones who are making policies. Um, so I'm very, very grateful for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Kiso. And we're great. Uh, Manila? Well, I would like to thank you. Uh, I would like to thank UNESCO and MJIP for this great opportunity. Like the, uh, I am a very shy person. Like I don't have this exposure, but UNESCO is giving me this wonderful opportunity to uh, to represent the whole youth out there. there. I know there are so many people. I have read the face. I mean, the people who are participated in this taggy session on the Facebook and the Instagram. Are, their ideas are so awesome. Like I mean. Everyone should be given this opportunity and thank you so much for giving us this opportunity. I would like to tell you something that the change has already started. Maybe the change is not reflecting in the education systems right now, but the change has already started in the youth. They're doing everything they can, uh, info, uh, like uh, unofficially, I would say. And it's, it's just a matter of time. The gov officials uh, recognize this and bring that change. And I'm very thankful for the national education policy which was introduced in India. And I think uh, it will get, you know, uh, get into action very soon. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Manila. And Manila and Kisuwen, I think, I believe this is, as Manila said, the beginning of change when we are uh, having youth, uh, the speakers and our audience interact with the uh, Minister of Education because the recommendations, uh, the understanding of the broader picture of the purpose of education is where actually we get to start with changing to make better for in our communities and in the communities we, several communities we talked about. Uh, Dr. Ali, I'm, um, uh, you know, uh, thank you so much for being uh, with us today. Thank you for listening. Uh, uh, to the you, thank you for uh, giving us, uh, you know, a, a good picture of that we are headed in the right direction. Hoping that the 44% who are unhappy with their experience share with us specific uh, examples of 
the reason of un why they're unhappy and we include it uh, in communication further with you, Dr. Ali. Uh, and then again, we'll see you with our next uh, taggy uh, dialogue. Thank you very much.